graduated from I graduated from um, the University of Richmond in 2013. And since then, I have been working in the field of data for the last eight years. Um, I started uh, working with Microsoft SQL Server um, and SSIS data tools. And over the years, I have moved towards using um, bigger platforms, more cloud technology, um, and most recently, our company has started to implement Apache Spark uh, applications for our various clients. And so I'm very happy to talk to you about Apache Spark and some of the practical applications of using Spark. Um, now, I'm going to be very uh, quick in terms of going over the architecture and going over um how spark works there's lots of great literature about the internal workings of spark and if you want to read those white papers you can my goal is to give you a more practical the more practical side of using spark in a uh, in your day-to-day -day lives um, if you want to go into data engineering and my hope is that you can get a better understanding about not just how to process data but best practices in terms of processing large volumes of data. All right, so let's go. So the agenda, we're going to talk about Spark. We're going to talk about the pros and cons of using Spark, um, because with applications such as Spark, it's always, there's always gives, given, gives and takes. Um, I'm going to talk about practical applications of just using Sparks. And then I'm going to do a code demo. Uh, before we do the code demo, um, I'm going to open up for a Q&A, and then we'll, if we have time left, we'll do, uh, after the demo, we'll also do additional Q&A for anyone who has questions after that. Um, so again, um, my background, I've been working in data for eight, for eight plus years. I've been working with R for RTS Labs for about four years, um, and I'm proficient in Python, SQL, Postgres, MySQL and other cloud technologies, including Azure and AWS, with a little bit, bit of work in uh, Google Cloud. So let's talk about what Apache Spark is. Um, so Apache Spark uh, is the latest big platform for processing data at large scales. It's a unified analytics engine, which means that it can basically talk to many different data sources and can facilitate a unified way for multiple engineers, multiple data scientists to work within a single platform. Um, the reason why Apache Spark is so popular these days is because it's supported by uh, high level APIs that can be written in Java, Python, Scala, and R. Um, and the other reason why it's very popular is because it is basically, it basically has a built-in task manager, which I'll go into a, a little bit deeper into the program. But basically, if you give it a, an order, it will figure out before it runs the process the best way to execute it internally within the cluster that you've set up. Um, in addition to uh, having the high level APIs, they have also high level tools. So the four most popular ones are Graph, GraphX, Spark SQL, Spark Streaming, and Machine Learning Library. Um, for those of you who don't know what GraphX is, uh, that's basically for 3D imaging um, and processing. Uh, and Spark Streaming is for interacting with streaming sources um, such as Kafka, um, or uh, AWS Firehose. Um, and obviously machine learning library is for machine learning. Um, Apache Spark is written in Scala, which runs on a, a Java virtual machine. So it's supported in Windows, Unix, and Docker. And currently the latest version is 3.1.2. So that just gives you a broad um, broad sense of just what Apache Spark is. Um, it's really just, at the end of the day, it's just a program to help you run data processes. 
Now, one of the reasons why it's so efficient in running large batches of data is just its general architecture. So in the same way that you would want to process um, items in small batches rather than just going and doing it in one big, big foul swoop, Spark handles your data in small batches. So typically, a typical concern of uh, a typical cluster will have a master drive, master server, and then it will have several several different worker workers below it. And basically, the master's job is to coordinate um, work that is moving between the nodes. And what will happen is, if you give Spark a CSV to process. What it will do is it will break down that CSV into smaller chunks and we will distribute it amongst the various workers. And so the beauty about Spark is that let's say that you say or you say, I want to clean up this data row. Um, I want to remove all of the leading and trailing uh, blank spaces. When you give it that command, it doesn't go one by one through each row to actually execute its order. What it will do is it will break your CSV or your data set into smaller chunks and it will run that command against all the other smaller chunks and then bring them back together in one final data set. And this makes it very, very powerful in terms of handling large scale data sets because they operate independently of each other. Whereas uh, a technology like Hadoop requires you to actually coordinate between the workers. So, and this was something that was very important at the start of Spark when it, they came out with version one is the idea of the master node handling coordination between all the workers. Uh, before that, you would have to either process it as one large data set, or you would have to split the data set up by yourself and then process it one by one. So Spark gets rid of all of those, those complexities and it just does it for you in the back end. Um, Spark itself, um, <laughs> it's really powerful because you can basically connect to any sort of big data source or even small data source um, in the current marketplace. So starting at the top uh, left of the screen, um, starting with Kafka. Um, for those of you who don't know what Kafka is, it's basically a messaging messaging system that allows someone to communicate between two different applications. And this is what comes up with like live streaming, um, for example, stock prices. If you ever watch the stock market and you see the it going tracking up and down, well, those messages have to come from somewhere. And technologies like uh, Kafka support that. So Spark can tap into those live streams and basically pull data and do data execution. Um, you can connect to various databases directly from Apache Spark. You can uh, you can uh, connect to Hadoop, which is a file share, which is a file share system. Um, and then you can also uh, connect to object stores, which are supported in um, in the cloud these days. Um, for those of you who don't are not familiar with with the big three cloud providers, um, they're Azure Blob Storage, AWS S3, and then Google Google Cloud Storage. Um, Apache Spark can connect to all three of these sources. And can you are able to pull that data in pull that data into memory and execute your um, execute your workflows, uh, and then obviously the bigger database technologies such as Redshift and um, uh, Big Qu Google BigQuery are also um, available um, as data sources and as well as data endpoints. Um, so. I know I'm moving really fast um, through this and hopefully with your questions, we can get into the more nitty gritty details. Um, and I know it's a lot of information thrown at you, um, but 
it's really important to understand pros and cons of using Spark. Spark is has a lot of positives. It's very fast. It's very easy to use when we're when you're using high the high level APIs. It's multilingual, which means teams that are used to writing in Java can write their their processes in Java. If you're if you're familiar with Python, you can write it in Python. You can support big data initiatives, um, and you can scale your Spark cluster to support larger and larger data sets. Now there are issues with this because Scala or because uh, Spark is written in a Java virtual machine that it it means that it's dependent on understanding how um, to run and maintain a, a Java virtual machine. These days you can um, spin up your own a, a Spark cluster using services on cloud providers. But the problem with that is that Apache Spark is current, the latest version is 3.1.2. And most um, big companies such as Google or Amazon only allow you to uh, run uh, by default version two, the latest version of version two. So if you were going to implement Spark, the, Spark today, um, most likely what you would have to do is you would have to build your own environment on a cloud provider, ideally, and maintain it, which means that you need to have some, um, some knowledge of, of, of Java virtual machines or Java, yeah, for Java virtual machines. Um, this means that, uh, you know, that's a little bit of technical debt that you have to have to incur in order to run Apache Spark. The other thing um, is that the way that Apache Spark works is that all your data is brought into memory. And so Apache Spark by itself does not have a file management system, which is why um, the connectors to S3, Hadoop, um, to uh, Microsoft SQL Server, or these other data, data sources um, is important. And so if you were going to run Spark jobs, um, and actually process this data, you need to have a, a defined data source. Apache Spark doesn't have um, its own external file management system in order to support that. So you just need some external connection to your data in order to bring it into memory. Um, the, other, the other issue is uh, small, small file sizes. And, and I know this as a, as a, as a big issue just in data in general. So in the same way that I told you that Spark breaks down a giant file um, to process the data into, and, and I'll just go back to this. So in the same way that Spark takes your giant data set and then breaks it down into small chunks and distrib distributes them across the workers, that is only with one big file. If you are processing a thousand files at a hundred megabytes each, that is a big coordination problem that will not only eat up memory, but it will make the pro processing all of those files take a longer longer time. And that gets even worse if you're talking about like a streaming data source. So with streaming services, you can probably get you know you could get up upwards to like a thousand messages per second in some cases. But if you're storing that in a, an S3 or some sort of file system, that can only measure out to be, you know, maybe 10 megabytes of data. And uh, the way, and for Spark, the ideal is to have it process a gigabyte or more of data at one time in order for you to get that optimization level anything lower for Apache Spark, it doesn't hurt hurt it, but it, it's not as optimal. It's kind of like mar marginal returns. At the ver at some point, too much date, too too many files gives you less return. And at the lower at the lower end, it doesn't it doesn't give it doesn't give you as much. There's sort of an ideal 
point on the curve where that it's just the right amount to give you the best optimization for your process. So that's so that's another that's another um, that's another thing. Um, the um, the last thing that I would say on on as a con is that there is um, there is a learning curve to Apache Spark, um, in the sense that um, if you're not familiar with um, with SQL notations or how to perform SQL queries, um, it does give you a, a little bit of a learning curve just to get into that mentality. A lot of de developers today sort of stick with the you know the the friendly favorites python java c sharp but not a lot of developers uh consider sql essential to uh, to their work these days and i take the opposite view i take the take the view that if you're going to work in data or even if you're going to be working as a back-end developer doing um spring boot or uh mvc development for uh, for c sharp applications you need to know sql um, in order to interact with the data, interact with the database. And this is true for Apache Spark, because the way that Spark implements a lot of its native um, uh, function functionality is based on SQL, um, which is very powerful because it's a standard language that users can um, work with. But if you're not familiar with, C with SQL statements or SQL logic, then onboarding can be uh, slightly difficult. Um, and uh, down here at the bottom, um, I just wanted to give you another, uh, the other context, an another way of looking about how uh, Spark clusters are managed. Again, you have the, the worker nodes that have an executor with various tasks. These are the uh, smaller um, data sets that, it, that it's working with. There's a con cluster manager, which is the master node. And then you actually have the program, um, which I will show you in the demo. But basically, your program defines how your Spark application um, is basically compiled and run within the cluster. Um, and, and that is where sort of everything is defined. So it's just a different way of looking about how the Spark application works and is executed. All right. so. I know I, again I know I'm I'm going through this fast because I want to because I feel like most most of your questions um, will get will provide us a better platform to discuss Apache Spark but in practice Apache Spark is just a data processing center there it has great orchestration within the tool and within the application that you code the problem is that not the problem but one requirement for having um, Apache Spark um, used within your organization is that you need a way to orchestrate and integrate Apache Spark into workflows. So you can think of it as as uh, as uh, logistics. You're um, you're uh, you're moving moving your stuff from you're moving your uh, produce or whatever. Um, from the warehouse to the supermarket, right? And the vehicle in order for, to do that is your truck. Well, the, the fruit or whatever you have in the warehouse has to, get, has to be gotten there somewhere. And so when you think of the workflow chain, Apache Spark is just one piece sort of in the center. You still need ways in order for the data to be available for, for the Spark application to run, and you need somewhere to put it at the end. And so just having Apache Spark as a cluster um, is just a cluster. It will just sit there. And unless you have a way to make the data available um, through uh, object storage or, or file system, um, execute it and put it somewhere, it's you can't do anything else. So. Again, you just need some sort of orchestration tool to do it. In most cases, what that will mean is you being on your laptop and you hitting enter to run your process. But if you're going to do something more sophisticated, um, then it's important for you to have some that those those tools in order for things to work. 
Um, I saw there was a question. Um, I'm almost done with this piece and we'll, we'll get to that right away. Um, um, the other thing um, is again, Apache Spark is offered um, in most cloud providers. Um, the issue that, that we often see in the field is that they're running um, version two, um, whereas the latest version is version three. Um, and that's a bit, and that's a major release. And so version three has um, better optimization, better standards for the higher APIs um, and just provides um, more functionality. Um, and so there are third party platforms such as Databricks and Data Mechanics that will allow you to run newer versions and pro will provide you um, with uh, different ways of executing Apache Spark. Um, the other thing that you can do if you just want to run it locally um, is you can um, build your own cluster with Docker, um, which is actually something that I recommend um, as a way to do implementation locally um, because uh, <laughs> Docker puts everything in isolation. Um, you create a small, small virtual cluster within your machine that is not attached to the OS. Um, and it just allows you to work with Apache Spark in a more intimate way and actually configure the way that you want it to. Um, so in practice, what we've seen with most of our clients these days is that if they need to run Apache Spark, what they will typically do is that they will run their own um, custom clusters um, to not only manage costs, but to also manage the environment. Um, these days, because most corporations and most, uh, most companies work with data from, from various, um, not only vendors, but also internal sources, um, they need uh, more specialized and secure methods of not only moving data across the network, but also um, secu securing, securing their data. Um, and while the cloud providers can offer you tools, um, what we find is that managing your managing your own cluster, um, while it has a big upfront cost, has lower down downstream um, or continual costs to not only yourself but also to the client. Um, there are a few things that I do want to say about Apache Spark in practice. Um, if you go through the literature, you will see that there's low APIs and high and high APIs. Um, in almost every case, I will tell you that if you use the high the high level APIs and avoid using any code references to the RDDs, um, which are um, if I go back um, up front, it's these uh, it's these lower level blocks where you can program um, Spark to interact with these blocks individually. My recommendation is that you limit that, um, that actions as much as possible. And the reason why is that you are prone to making mistakes and you are prone to um, writing code that is not optimized to work within the cluster. Um, the best example of that would be if you want to loop through all or go loop through all of the partitions. Um, the in Apache Spark, um, the way that it works is it does separate all the data into various sections. But the way that you interact with it on the API level is you talk about talk about partitions. And so you can go through each partition and do an action, but that action may be supported by a higher level API. So before you go into the weeds, you, you should see if there's um, something um, within the higher level APIs that you can use. And for me personally, I like to use Spark SQL um, almost all the time um, because that is just an easier way to logically work through the problem that you're trying to work trying to do. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the other thing is that Scala and Java 
are always going to be faster than Python and R. Um, faster is a relative term. Um, if you if you write a Spark application that processes two terabytes of data in an hour in Python, and then if you build the exact same thing in Scala and it takes forty minutes, I would argue that that is a, that is a significant time improvement from a developer's point of view, but from a business businessman's point of view, that may not even matter, you know. But if you're if it's reduced from like eight hours to two hours by switching languages or or switching ideas or switching the way that you, the application works, that is a significant significant time saving. And for me personally, I like to use Scala or Java more than I like to use Python. The reason why is because when because uh, it's uh, because Spark works within the JVM, tools that natively interact with that system are just easier to integrate with. Um, and there, again, there's nothing against Python or, or R. Um, you just need to have a little bit more overhead if you're going to work with those um, work with those languages. And if you use a system like Databricks or Data Mechanics, you may not have to even worry about that additional overhead, they will work with it. Um, and the last thing that I will say is that in practice, um, don't be lazy about your programming, um, specifically around data types. Um, there's um, there's often the, the need um, to say, hey, let, uh, let uh, Spark figure out the data types. If I'm working with a CSV, you know, just let them infer what the data types are. In practice, never do that. If you're going to take the time to write a Spark application, you want to be explicit about, I want this this column to be an integer. I need this column to be um, a double, uh, a, a double int or, or uh, a double type. Be explicit because not only will that um, add additional performance to your work, it will also uh, let let you be. It, it won't break your programming because if you for example have a date native and if you don't specify it well spark may not bring it in as a date they may bring it it may bring it in as a string and if you ask it to parse that column as as the date what it may have to do under the hood is convert it into a date beforehand and then do the parsing so being explicit about what you want your data types to be will always save you time in the end. Um, I'm not going to I'm, I'm not going to go th into this as, as huge detail, but this is an example of the, um, the the data pipeline orchestration that I talked to you about. So in this example, the data lake um, is in S3. You're processing it with Apache Spark and then you're pushing it to some sort of warehouse mm -hmm. and underlying everything is Apache Airflow. If you don't know what Apache Airflow is, it's just an orchestration tool um, written in Python. Um, and what it will help you do is coordinate movement of the data or movement of a workflow from point A to point B. Um, again, as you can see, if you only had Apache Spark in the middle, um, you can you could you know press enter and have it do this, but with Apache Airflow or some other orchestration tool, you can schedule schedule it to run. Um, you can write error messages. Uh, you can handle exceptions, so on and so forth. So this is just a small example of a pipeline. Okay, this is uh, the part where it's Q and A. I'm going to stop sharing my screen at this moment so that I can go to uh, to your questions. Um, I have one question already here. Um, I'm going to open it up. Uh, please submit your questions um, through, through the Q&A uh, chat window. I will go through it. Um, whoever raised your hand, um, uh, I guess. Do, would you like me to? Yes, go ahead. For the person who raised their hand, uh, since we have uh, 12 participants, we can. I think we could have a, a broader discussion. Um. Whoever raised their hand, can you do that again? Because I don't see it anymore. 
Great. I thought I saw someone raise their hand. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I was wrong about that. Maybe we can answer the Q and A question first. And yeah. Then okay. Um, how are SQL injections affected by Apache Spark? Um, so, are you talking about SQL, uh, James? Are you talking about SQL injections in terms of like a hack um, into Apache Spark, or are you talking about SQL injections just as part of programming? James, feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to answer that. Um, because, because, uh, because, well, so assuming that SQL injections are are basically uh, are programmatic, um, you don't have to worry about that. Um, the Spark application itself will always be self-contained. Um, Oh, um, well, so see, so well, so for SQL injections, that's mostly um, done against against applic applications, um, specifically for data and for for data integrity. It's more important to secure your your website against the SQL injections and attacks. Um, for the Spark. The reason why I talk about Spark SQL is mostly in the sense that it allows you to interact with your data using SQL statements, which I can show you, which I will show you on the code code demo, as just a way to to work with um, uh, work with the data specifically. Um, are there any other questions at this time? If not, I'll move on. Um, Oh, front end development tech stack mostly compatible. So, um, so with with um, with Apache Spark, if you wanted to integrate it with a uh, with an application, the way that you would actually do it is probably um, so. The way that I would recommend to do it um, from a front end side is you need a back end back end uh, integration. So uh, I believe that with Spring Boot, um, you can um, interact with Apache Spark because essentially it's just a cluster. Um, it has its own, um, in, in the documentation, um, there's a high level API, not high level, but there are ways that you can um, connect to clusters in order to run it. So for example, if your um, Apache Spark um, is managed on Databricks, Databricks itself is a, um, is a SaaS product and has its own APIs. So from a front end perspective, you could probably hit those APIs directly um, in order to run, run your work. Um, I would avoid um, from like a front end development standpoint, um, hitting, hitting a Spark cluster. Um, the only reason why is that you're not um, guaranteed a reasonable rate of return. It could take you several minutes in order to, to do it. Um, hey, May, um, so uh, learning uh, Apache Spark. Um, so one of the best, best resources um, would be um, the Apache Spark website itself. Um, I can, uh, we can send out uh, some learning materials after this. Um, Specifically, I can I can send it to, to Code Day, and they can send it to all participants um, on on this uh, webinar. But um, the uh, the website itself is probably the best. Uh, Stack Overflow is always a great great resource, um, and there are several books that you can order off of um, uh, order off of Amazon or Barnes and Noble um, in order to get started. Um, to be honest, um, if you want to learn Apache Spark, Spark itself, um, the, you can learn the syntax, but it's always a good to apply it to a problem. A lot of data data issues, or or the reason why that data data engineering or data science is hard to get into, is because from a practical standpoint, you need to find an issue where you can actually showcase your skills. Um, 
my recommendation, um, which is actually what I'll show you in the code demo, um, is there are a lot of open data sources uh, through uh, both Azure Cloud and AWS. Um, and my favorite data set to work with um, in order to actually do interactive learning um, is the New York City taxi data. Um, and I think that's a, a good segue into, into the code demo um, because that data set is free to the public and you could do whatever you want with it. Um, and then that will give you a good um, platform in order to start building Spark applications and, and working with large amounts of data if you choose to. So let me go ahead and uh, boot up my, uh, my code demo. Um, I've written this in Python. Um, I have uh, gone through and um, tried to make this as simple as possible in order for everyone to sort of understand how, what's going on. So actually, let's let's start with the data itself. Um, so as I was saying, the New York City taxi data um, is a great resource um, because they make their taxi trip data um, available to everyone. Um, you can download CSVs directly from the internet. Um, and uh, it's just a very, it's a, it's a great data set um, just to start working with. Um, and so for this demo, what I've done is I have um, gotten all the data sets from, um, from 2020. Um, this year, uh, due to COVID, it was a much lighter year, so the files themselves are much smaller. But even so, um, what I've done is I've compressed them using gzip. Um, which would be what I re recommend you do anytime you work with data localized. If you have the ability to compress it, um, do so. It saves on space. Um, and in a practical setting, if you have a large amount, amount of data, if you have terabytes of data, you would want to compress that in order to save space. Um, so this is one data set. Um, the other data set um, is this uh, lookup data set. Um, which I can show you, show you here briefly. So uh, they have, um, like with any data set, they don't give you all the values. They usually represent, uh, for example, in this case, location ID uh, with an integer. Um, and so uh, this is a mapping, doc mapping, mapping document that will tell you that location ID one, if you see that within your data set, uh, that will be um, uh, New Jer Newark, um, right here, if it's nine, this is Queens in the in the in the borough zone, and so on and so forth. So I have these two data sets, and these are the two data sets that I'll be working with um, in my in the demo. So first and uh, foremost, um, we have uh, our main Python application. Um, for this uh, demo, what I've done is I've used uh, pip pip env pip environment package in order to maintain all, all of my dependencies and basically create a virtual um, a virtual library in order to access the data. Um, if you want more information about uh, PIP environment, um, I'll, I can provide you with that link as well. Um, we'll just go through this one by one. So the first, first things first is um, for Spark, we have to build our session. Um, this tells uh, the master cluster um, where uh, where the cluster is, what's the name of the app, and uh, how many um, uh, how many workers do I want to spin up in order for this to work. Um, this would be configured here. For example, if I wanted four, I would just say four, um, but just putting star running it locally, it will just manage it by itself. Um, next uh, goes with the data uh, schemas. So this is what I mean by lazy programming. I could, um, for example, here, instead of putting the schema, I could say infer, infer schema equals true. And what this means is that as the data files are being read into the cluster, it will say, well, this, this data looks like a date, this data looks like an integer, this one looks like a float. 
Um, but as I said, that's very inefficient, especially when you're dealing with large numbers of files and large numbers of data. So what I have done is I have created um, these, uh, this taxi, uh, this taxi schema list. And basically, um, you could find it on any, um, any of the documentation. But basically, for every single uh, row in the CSV, what I've done is I've labeled it with its appropriate data type. Um, so for example, so date, this one is a date, um, this one is a string, so on, so on and so forth. In this case, most of the data object or the data rows are either integer or double, um, which is just basically a decimal. Um, and then I do the same thing with my um, with my other lookup table, um, which uh, you know just gives it a your data structure type. Next, um, I've built my sessions. I've defined my data schemas. And the next thing to do is actually to create the SQL data frames or the Spark data frames. Um, basically, uh, for this first one, um, I'm basically telling it where to get the files. Uh, notice right here, I'm using this star. Um, this basically tells me to get every uh, single file um, from the resource data with uh, CSV um, gzip. You get passing it the schema, telling it that the separation is, is comma separated and that the first row is actually a header. Um, doing the same thing with the with the with the lookup, um, and what this will do is it'll read the data into the C, into the data frame um, and bring it into memory. Um, the next thing um, that I'm doing, um, so which you could think of it this way, you're bringing um, everything from Spark Spark into memory. Um, but your main API um, interaction with the data source would actually be through taxi data frame or zone data frame, if you wanted to work with those directly. However, what Spark will allow you to do is actually create in-memory views of the data set, which is what I'm doing, doing in this case. What this means is that if I wanted to write more complicated SQL statements like the one below, I can just reference that as a table. Um, the best way that I like to think about this is that Spark allows you to create a mini database in memory at the time that it's run and that you can interact with it like any other database. So what I do in this case is I create the data frame um, and the zone, I put it into a temporary view label it taxi and zone. And then I basically run my custom Spark, C, Spark uh, custom SQL Spark, Spark statement. Um, I save it into a separate data frame um, that I will be able to interact. Um, but basically I then tell it to tell the Spark cluster um, to actually just run the SQL statement. And what you can see is that um, I'm doing a lot of things in this statement. So in, for example, in this statement, I'm using um, a, a case um, case function. I'm basically saying, you know, obviously you can read it. It's pretty straightforward. Um, if the vendor ID is one, give it this name. If the vendor ID is two, give it this name. If it's none of those, give it other. Um, I am bringing in, I'm joining the zone data set to the location as a, as a separate data, as a separate data column. And then I am doing my own aggregation against uh, the taxi data for total amount. And I'm really renaming it total revenue. Um, and then I'm also adding a conditional clause where total amount is greater than zero because I don't want I don't want to bring those in. And then I'm doing a, a, a grouping for my aggregation and then I'm set, giving it an order. So the point, the reason why I'm going through this and showing you this is that this is a very complicated statement. To me, it's not very complicated, but if you were to actually program this um, in just using normal coding with uh, with the data frame, with the individual data frames, it might take you, it, it, it will be much more complicated. 
And so if you, so for me, treating it like uh, an in-memory database and doing all the processing through SQL statements, it just makes everything more concise. Um, so for me, that's the way that I want, that I like to do it. So let's go ahead and actually run this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to um, boot up my virtual, my virtual environment. And then I'm going to do um, Spark submit. I'm going to submit, oh, and I'm going to submit. I forgot it doesn't support. You know, one thing that you should know is that if you're working in the virtual environment, things that you've already installed at the higher level may not come past. But as you can see, as I'm writing writing the writing this out, you can see from the command line, it's processing the data um, in various steps. Um, Spark does come with a okay UI that if you were to actually run this in a production setting that you could access um, and you could see it visually. Personally, I don't think it gives you that much value, um, but it's there. Um, so as you can see, see at the very end, um, I get my results um, that are printed out here, and I've actually got this as a bigger, bigger one. So um, so so in this case, um, you can see here that uh, it, it was able to process it, it was able to get the data back. Um, and that basically con concludes the demo. Um, but um, from this standpoint, you can see that it was able to process all the files that I needed to. I was able to interact and combine the data in the way that I wanted to. Um, and then um, I was able to get, get results. Um, if I wanted to, um, I could tell Spark to actually write this to an S3 location or some other um, file management system in order to save it, and it could be accessed by others. Um, I could also tell it to write it as um, a different file format. Um, so, so for example, I could have told it to um, write it as a you know a gzip, um, a CSV G, a gzip a gzip format. Or I could tell it to run it um, as a uh, as a parquet. You know, there's many different ways that you could uh, tell it to um, process and export the data. Um, so that's my demo. Um, I can al I'll also make this code code base available to to us after after this presentation if you would like to um, to use it. Um, I will open it again to uh, various questions. Um, for anyone who wants to ask in the next, uh, for the final seven minutes. Um, if you, if we want, if you want to ask me other questions outside of the webinar, go ahead, you could always, uh, I think they'll provide my LinkedIn, um, uh, LinkedIn information that you could get a hold of me through questions. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation, but yes, the LinkedIn will be in the description area so that page that you guys signed up for this talk on the labs.codate.org website um if you if it's not there or you can't find it feel free to dm me on slack uh again my name is Alper. um if you guys have any questions feel free to raise your hand or ask in the q a we'll wait a little to see if they have any more questions you don't all, also, you don't have to ask me about Spark. I'm happy to answer any other data questions that you might have. Um, Apache Spark is just one component of a large field. So if you have any other data, general data questions, I would also be happy to answer those as well. All right, man, how did I get started with data architecture? Um, so, uh, so it honestly it was um, kind, kind of by accident. Um, I uh, 
uh, I started working for a mortgage company straight out of college, um, and I was working with their SQL Server and SSIS packages um, to move data be, uh, amongst their systems and do reporting. Um, after that, I moved into more strictly reporting role and building um, workflows within SQL Server. Um, at my current job with an RTS, um, we had a bigger portfolio of um, data projects. And so uh, by necessity, I had to um, start uh, building uh, workflows um, and other cloud architecture in order to support our clients. Um, what what most people do in terms of data architect is they start they start by being data engineers um, and then as you gain more experience you move out of the data engineering role and you become more of a data architect um, it's being a data data architect um, is it's a it's a very difficult job um, mostly because you're not only dealing with um, um, technology but you're also dealing with the business side of the of the equation as well, um, and really the only way that you can have appreciation for both is if you actually are doing a lot of data engineering work um, with clients, understanding how data moves between systems, understanding what some of the pitfalls of working with data are, um, specifically with cloud technology, specifically today with cloud technology, um, and also just um, how to deliver to clients uh, because in most cases uh, client or your clients or whoever you're working with with the data want to have it presented to them in some way um, that is usable um, in, in their daily daily lives and daily jobs um, and so just getting that experience um, right off the bat is difficult if you're just really green um, so what I would say is that if you want to become a data architect, um, be a data engineer, um, get that experience, get that understanding of how is data is moving through through the system, um, and that will give you a better understanding about how to join uh, point A with point B, um, and how point C is affected by what you're doing. Great question, by the way. Um, any other any other questions for uh, for Spark and or our data engineering, data architecting? Any of those? Okay. Well, if there are no other questions, I thank you all for uh, the time. Um, I know there was a lot to process and Spark is a big application, but I will um, obviously provide my code base. I will provide my um, uh, my information if you'd like to get to hold, hold of me, um, as well as some learning materials uh, and links that you can use in order to get um, more familiar with, with Spark um, and or data. Thank you so much, John, for being here with us today. We really appreciate the presentation and all the time you took on behalf of everyone at Labs. Um, yeah, uh, so I'll give the LinkedIn details to every all the students who are interested, so they should be able to contact you with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, sounds good. Uh, thank you so much again. Uh, thank you all the attendees for being here and have a great day, everyone. All right, bye. Thank you. Thank you.